Hi, my name's Jason, and this is the continuation of Christianity and Insanity. What is it about faith that resembles symptoms of a mental illness? Now, we probably all know about Bill Maher, and as anti-religious as I am, I don't like Bill Maher. In fact, I'm the kind of guy who gravitates towards Bible believers I love to talk to them. I love to do music with them. I love to find things that I agree with them about. And I love to honor and explore my 12-year past of being in that world full of people who taught me compassion, unconditional love, faith, blind faith, <laughs> and a lot of things in my life that I wasn't demonstrated in my community, which was a very intellectual community. And I honor these people for the fact that in the United States of America, they were not only probably the biggest influence before we even became a country, and not only that though, they're the ones who were there for me when I was homeless. They were, they were the ones that were there for me when I didn't have any friends. And I was really hard to be around, and I'm still hard to be around. If you know anything about PTSD, personality disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, you know that people like us are really hard to be around. So one of the things that I talk about when I talk about people of faith, especially Bible believers, we're talking about strong people. We're talking about people that are bold, and many of them are quite fearless. Now, mind you, it's obvious they have an aversion to things that are really, like, not very scary at all. I think the example I like to give is Harry Potter. And, and when I was spending eight years of sort of fading out of the church, I said, well, let me watch these evil Harry Potter movies. And I think there's, what, eight or nine of them or something like that. And I thought, well, they're okay. But didn't seem to like harm my faith. It didn't seem to give me ideas about putting evil spells on people. And uh, it didn't give me demons. <laughs> However, when I was really heavily into the church is when Harry Potter became just a worldwide fascination. And church parents were just freaking out about this when there were threats to the well-being of children that were happening within the church. And of course, the craziest thing is that when somebody's in a position of power and they're trusted, that there's very little accountability about church leaders having access to children. And of course, this is one of the biggest that's beyond crazy that's deplorable and disgusting. And we like to point the fingers at the Catholic Church a lot because they've created the worst environment for children when you've got a guy who's supposed to be celibate and he's got access to children privately on a regular basis. And the Catholic Church tried to do stuff like that. They made some token efforts. And according to which diocese you're in, they would do more or less, or which period of time you're in. And I've seen the Catholic Church really work hard to raise awareness. In fact, they've even said some things with, I think it's called their Virtus program, that a sexual predator isn't necessarily a homosexual, and a homosexual isn't necessarily a sexual predator. I thought, wow. Um, and then I was at another diocese, and I'm not ready to tell this story publicly, but it was absolutely disgusting how they treated a very obvious, harmful, potentially harmful situation to minors. Now, that's in the Catholic context. When I was in Bible-believing churches, the Protestant-type folks, I also saw that there was a lot of daycares, a lot of children's programs, and they would throw these volunteers in there without screening them. And when it comes to sexual predators, it is so rarely 
a female issue. These are men. 90-something percent of the time, I would say 99 point something percent of the time, as far as what I understand, as what the real threat is. This is a problem with men. And it's not just stranger danger because we like to point the fingers at strangers and we hate to point the fingers at those who are respected and loved and that have really solid reputations is what the kind of people I've dealt with. And I've lived with two sexual predators in my life and I've figured out the way they think, the way they operate, the way they create the world, the way they mess with their own heads. And it's the most disgusting thing I think that I can think of when it comes to crazy in the church because they're creating these little monsters when they violate them in these ways and when they're in a place of power typically they're messing with these kids heads so it's a psychological abuse it's a sexual abuse but what it really is is they are rewiring their nervous system they're creating a type of trauma that the kids uh, either know about or they don't know about or they've totally blanked out because there is a lot of hypnotic suggestion when it comes to leadership in church. And when it comes to being hypnotized and folks that are vulnerable to hypnotic suggestion, which a lot of Pentecostal, charismatic, full gospel, tongue-talking people are extremely vulnerable to hypnotic suggestion. And I found this true when I was around some of these big revival things too. And there was an idea that if people were going through something that had the influence of something really big and really powerful, that it must be God. And the kids would respond because the kids are extremely vulnerable to hypnotic suggestion. And I'd see the kids fall off their chairs and laugh and scream. And and, um, and it was really powerful at the time. And I would either be on stage typically doing music or I'd be in the congregation. And I was right there with it most of the time. And if I didn't like yield to what was going on, then I was kind of looked at as, well, there's something wrong with me. And I see a lot of folks that were just... Uh, and they call themselves bound in religion if they were in a, in a religious community that was more intellectual. And it's interesting how you get around Baptists. Baptists are actually really scholarly people. The more intense a Baptist is, the more you find that they read a lot of books. But of course, they're Baptist books and they're Bible-based books, but they know a lot of stuff. <laughs> But if they're dispensationalists, which if they believe that the work of the Spirit had passed with the apostles, then they got to have something to convince them to live based on an old ideology that is very hard to maintain in a postmodern society. And so they either have to be around stuff that convinces themselves constantly that what they're doing is right, and they've got to shape this God-ruled world constantly which is creating ruts in your thinking otherwise known as brainwashing and they do it to themselves and I tell you one of the biggest forms of brainwashing is social media and of course like Trinity Broadcasting Network and a lot of I mean I've I've had times when I was first a born-again Christian I would be in seven services a week two on Sunday and then I would go through five um, like home group type stuff and a midweek service and I had to immerse myself in this and that's what they encourage you to do and it was exhausting <laughs> and when folks are trying to raise kids and they're spending all this time at church especially if they're not generating any income if they're volunteering themselves and I've had a lot of access and a lot of influence lately of the LDS church and it's amazing how few employees they actually have even their bishops and the folks that are over the bishops volunteer positions and when they talk so much about the family which is good because I was raised in a world where you treated kids as little adults you lectured them you didn't really discipline them you just messed with their heads and whatever 
and you know being raised as a product of the sexual revolution wasn't fun and i'm also glad that i wasn't raised with fundies fundamentalist bible believing christians because that would have stifled my creativity and a lot of things in my life but being raised with a hypersexual ideology and then going into a hyper <laughs> sort of restraint of sexuality and being celibate for over a decade of my life right at my sexual peak very few people can do that there's probably a few monks that have done that and that's a form of crazy is hey this is a natural function that if done in the context of a safe environment or a loving partner or, or whatever sexuality can be you know uh, not a dangerous thing can be a healthy thing for somebody and i also know that when somebody is so completely what they called it sold out or on fire they'd use these terms and they would encourage people to go to extremes and just try to come up to strangers on the street and get them to make a decision that's going to affect their whole life and then we use scare tactics we do anything to try to influence people and we weren't necessarily in a cult it's just that this was the common behavior that we had when you watch a lot of tv preachers and when you lock when you when you watch a lot of local preachers is that they give you mark 16 the great commission and he says we must go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature and blah 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 and it's a big motivating factor that if we were to tell everybody that we know and encourage them and influence them and try to do all these nice things to them like ned flanders is a great example of how crazy fundies can get but that's how the media and like matt greening and you know people like that that are especially and like he's from the portland area <laughs> <laughs> and so i know a lot about secular influence and how we view bible believing christians in fact we used to make fun of them uh, to the point when we had these two little end tables in a front entrance going from the hall to the living room well what do we call these things we put the car keys on one of them and and we might put our wallet or purse on the other one or We'll call them Jim and Tammy Baker, <laughs> actually. And we'd watch all the scandals in the 80s on TV, and we just thought that born-again Christians were just the most crazy, horrible people. We had, we'd make fun of our next-door neighbors who were born-again Christians. And the whole time I'm thinking, well, we're just looking at them from a distance, and we're taking all this stuff out of context. What are they really like? What do they really do in those churches? Why are they raising their hands and crying when they're worshiping? We don't do that at my church. They must be experiencing something. And I wanted an experiential faith. And I didn't get that in the Unitarian Universalist Church because we were talking about other people's spiritual experiences and about every religion we can think of. And we didn't make a lot of references to the Bible at all because most of the people there were recovering from Baptist and Catholic and Pentecostal experiences that were abusive, especially being raised as a kid. And man, it's amazing what these parents will do. One of the worst ones that I saw was when a kid uh, was falling down a hill in a park and he ran into like a, 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 a pillar, like, like a traffic pillar, and he hurt his back really bad because he was falling into this thing and he was just crying and crying. Here he was like 10, 11 years old. And his mother just starts pointing her finger and rebuking the devil and all this stuff. I mean, she didn't just hold the kid and say, oh, do we need to go to a hospital? And it turns out this kid was a real mess. And I'm, I don't even know if he's alive today. He's probably in his 30s by now. But it just gave me one of those lucid moments that, wow, I'm in a world that's full of crazy. Now, here's the thing, is that I talk to a lot of church people um, in my post-Christian career, is what I call it. And of course, they don't really consider me as a former Christian. They won't identify me as a former Christian. Of course, they will see me as a backslider, somebody who is always a born-again Christian, but I've just rejected the faith, and I'm either going to be once saved or all, you know, once saved, always saved, as you get every other Christian with that kind of doctrine, and then you get guys that interpret the Bible and take these scriptures, that you can lose your salvation, and you can choose to go to hell if, if you want to, and if you stop going to church, and you stop doing this, or you start doing these behaviors, or whatever. So I find it 
also difficult to identify as a post-Christian to the secular community or to Eastern religions and stuff like that because that's something a lot of people don't want to honor in their past. And it's amazing. I can get around a lot of born-again Bible believers. I'm not scared of them. I don't yell and scream at them. I don't avoid them. And once I come out as gay to them or once I come out as, you know, practicing um, and believing a lot of metaphysics and things like that, then they get scared of me. And it's so funny that these fearless and bold people are afraid of those who challenge their ideology. And I don't really argue with them. It's pretty rare that I do argue with them because I know that that's actually enhances and solidifies their belief systems a lot. And they love to argue. And of course, that's just a, a, a cliche that we have <laughs> when it comes to talking to people of faith uh, especially atheists, and atheists love to argue too, and I found that I got around atheists and I liked a lot of their ideas, I liked how they find hope in things besides invisible stuff, and they were very unhappy. <laughs> and I think deep down inside maybe they had this idea that there was a God, but they, for whatever reason, they were just bitter. Or maybe it was like when C.S. Lewis went to college and was hanging around with this professor that he admired. And he said, I was mad at God for not existing. And I think a lot of atheists are like that too, which is kind of a lot of crazy too, to, to, to acknowledge in some ways that there's a God and then to just basically deny this God and to try to convince everybody and argue with everybody. And at the same time, though, people that take the Bible pretty literally, especially when it comes to the book of Genesis, and there's very few people that take everything literally. Six-day creation, Adam and Eve, and stuff like that. However, you will see people that have what I call the Trinity Broadcasting Network type ideology, is that they agree with most of what goes on on Christian television and vice versa. And these are the type of folks who like to talk about their faith to as many people as they can. And it's not just because they think they have a mandate to preach the gospel to every creature and they'll be saved and if not, they'll go to hell. That's a pretty big motivating factor to boldly and fearlessly come up to these people and annoy the shit out of them and talk about this stuff that most people don't want to listen to unless they're in a vulnerable state, which is taking advantage of people in a mental health crisis when they really need mental health support. And when you study evangelism, they say, well, you know, one out of four people that you meet on average is going to be receptive because they're needy and they're in some kind of crisis. So that's horrible to take advantage of people who are experiencing mental health symptoms, whether they're high or low functioning. The other motivating factor, and this is where a lot of crazy comes in, is that when somebody is trying to live with an ideology that doesn't work, and it might work for a few people if they're heterosexual and they're happy with their partner, or they've lost their sex drive or whatever, and they have no desire for any type of drugs or alcohol or any type of sexual content or anything like that, or if they're asexual, which is an identifying factor in a lot of people's lives, they can handle that type of environment. It works for them. They're happy and they're content. For most people, though, they're going to live a compartmentalized life and they're going to live a lot of crazy and a lot of things that don't work, and they're going to have to not only convince themselves that it works constantly by listening and watching Christian television and radio and being in church environments and, and being around your own kind. And if you're not around your own kind when you're at work or whatever, you feel like you have to be this influence where you're influencing everybody or else you're scared that the world, the ways of the world, whatever they call it, the anti-Christian thing that is this mainstream thing that really freaks them out is going to influence them. So, I think, and I notice this about a lot of people who try to convince me and influence me in a biblical ideology and getting back into that, is what I think is they're trying to convince themselves 
they're trying to not be afraid of the fact that if I influence them, and it's so interesting, I kind of see the flow of energy. If I'm influencing them and I'm saying that conversion therapy is so psychologically harmful, it's been proven to be harmful, it gets them scared. I wish they would have some compassion, but typically the reaction is, oh, well, our church would never do that. But their church believes in that kind of stuff. It's the same ideology. It's the same harmful thing that made my life not worth living. And everybody that I try to share to that has that kind of ideology that God wants everybody to be heterosexual and God wants everybody this and that and this and that. And then God is some kind of person with a set of opinions that is trying to influence everybody on earth to be a certain way and, and establishing this sort of kingdom that is the opposite of what... Um, our instincts are and they're either influencing us to do things or not do things that are harmless and harmful um, there's this sort of thing that they can influence us to abstain from harmful things and to abstain from non-harmful things and of course you know those on the outside of the church we all know that and that's another form of crazy. And it's pretty cliche that we see as a whole when it comes to the secular left or whatever it is, is we tend to see the church as a lot about control. And they call themselves freedom. You know, Jesus will set you free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And we just love to get ourselves to think that we are free. When I was a missionary in Russia, it was eight years after the Iron Curtain fell. And I remember trying to preach to a guy through a translator. And he was a young man um, in our village that I was living in at the time. And I, and I used that as an example, is that Jesus will set you free. And it's so funny. Here's a guy who was raised under the Soviet Union, and he's enjoying his freedom for almost a decade. And then I tell him, hey, you could be free. <laughs> and so anyways, those were some of the things that I thought, wait a minute. You know, I have what I call these lucid moments. Like, okay, I either need to change my approach or this whole thing is really crazy trying to influence somebody to do something that is really hard to do and that might have a harmful effect on their life now when it comes to reformed criminals and reformed substance users and a lot of people who have been living a lot of self-harm and they get in an, an environment where nobody's drinking and cussing and, and all this. It's really refreshing for a lot of people. And it was what I call my second childhood because I needed it. I never really had that structure growing up. I had a lot of time alone when I was a kid and I needed that structure. I needed that consistency. I needed that safety. And I'm lucky to have been raised mostly in the same house and the same school. However, I did not have the things that really met the needs of young children, especially being the underdog and especially being a kid who had a lot of unmet needs and a lot of psychological damage, a lot of PTSD, and who didn't really have a dad around and stuff like that. So I was a prime candidate for being around abusive men, which didn't start until my 30s and I had a string of abusive relationships with men and I couldn't have survived that in my 20s and the other thing was being a professional quote professional musician or an ex-professional musician <laughs> uh, later in my 30s and in into my 40s I couldn't believe that the rock star lifestyle is real. The cliches about it, the access to drugs and alcohol and all that type of stuff is just as real as all the crazy cliches that you hear about and you see in movies on television about how crazy extreme churches are. And one of those things, and I think I mentioned this in the other video, 
was codependency. It enabled codependency because we were driven to do all this stuff and rescue people. We just seek out people. And, and, and in some ways, that's a good thing because there's a lot of people out there that need to be rescued. But we'd do it and it would be exhausting to us and our resources. And we'd be throwing our resources at these people who really needed psychological help. They needed clinical help. They needed a social worker to get them. And the church is left to do all this stuff because the government does very little of it. So we're stuck with trying to reform homeless people and trying to get them into our world and all this kind of stuff. And like I said, I was homeless when I became a born-again Christian, and they were the only ones there for me. And and uh, the evangelicals had a lot more resources, as far as I could tell, than the Catholic shelter. And yeah, I was made to sit down in those services, um, but I wanted it. And it was a time in my life when I was very receptive and I was experiencing some heavy delusional stuff. And yeah, I got a lot of crazy voices and a lot of crazy entities and spirits and angels or whatever they are that came from the Bible ideology and they were very controlling to my life. And at the same time, the kinds of voices and the kinds of things that I experienced growing up around heavy metaphysical influence, new age stuff, and typically people who were very high functioning that were following these voices of what they thought were aliens and all this kinds of stuff. And some of them were getting very rich and successful at doing that. But when somebody is, you know, experiencing pretty heavy abuse as a kid, psychological abuse, being under hypnotic suggestion and control and all this kind of stuff that I grew up with and seeing these things that were kind of like imaginary friends, but here I am as an adult and I'm painting pictures of these things and it was a lot of crazy. So when it comes to crazy, the metaphysical community, that's a whole nother thing. There's a lot of fucking crazy when it comes to the New Age movement, especially growing up in it. And the only people that wanted to listen to my story and that wanted to really understand about how fucked up it was were these born-again Christians. And it was so refreshing to say, hey, I was raised by a hypnotherapist. I had access to Ouija boards and all this stuff and trans channelers in my school and this the influence in my house. And this is what it did. And, and I was so consumed by these things. And I, I do believe in demons. I believe in the supernatural. I also believe in hypnotic suggestion. And there could very well be a lot of psychological explanations for this. But I could tell you was that something was taking over and it was leading me to insanity and self-harm and eventual destruction. And if it wasn't for the church having cast that crap out of me, I don't know what I would have done. It's just that it took me uh, almost a decade to get all that crap I got from the Bible world. And so hopefully... I've been able to cleanse myself from those influences that are trying to infiltrate our world and trying to establish these big kingdoms and this cult-like behavior, whether they are a cult or not. And it's amazing how much crazy there is with people that are high-functioning, non-mentally ill people, and they believe in things that aren't real. They hear voices. They follow them. They burn themselves out by trying to help people to the point when it destroys their family, like John G. Lake and the mission field, and we have story after story. And of course, the compartmentalization, and I'll get to that later.